Hi everybody, welcome to another Spectrum Economics video. Today I'm going to talk about Giffen goods. On Steemit I currently have a post that goes into a little bit of detail by what I mean by Giffen goods. So I just want to support that, or should I say supplement that with a video as well. Just to run by some of the basic concepts and exactly what we mean by a Giffen good. So here we go. As you can see from the, um, the picture here, we have potatoes. And potatoes can be considered by some people as a Giffen good. There's also other staples such as rice and maybe bread could also be considered Giffen goods. So why are they considered Giffen goods? Because they're basic essentials, so you need food in order to live. And basically rice and potatoes and bread are, are normally considered the lower cost food, but generally they're not as enjoyable as some of the other more expensive food. But if you have very little money, then in order to survive, you would spend that on, on the lower goods such as potatoes and rice. And if the price of potatoes and rice actually fell, then you actually have more money to buy some of the more enjoyable food that you might actually have with your potatoes or with your rice. So before I go into too much on this, I'll show you a little bit graphically and also with a, a nice little example of Fred Flintstone. But first, I need to explain to you what I mean by normal goods and also what I mean by inferior goods. So you can see in the graph here, this is a demand curve or a demand line. It looks more like a line. We call it a demand curve anyway. So if you've been reading some of my other posts and watching some of my other videos, you'll know what I mean by demand. So you can see from this demand here, you're going from equilibrium 1 down to equilibrium 2, and that's in the elastic proportion portion of the demand curve. So what happens is, when you go from price 1 down to price 2, your quantity increases from quantity 1 to quantity 2. The green area is the gain in revenue, and the red area is the loss in revenue from this decrease in price. If the green area is larger than the red area, that shows us that the demand is elastic. It also shows us that the demand is for what we call a normal good. So as you decrease the price, you get more and more revenue. So let's take a look now at what I mean by this graph here shows an inferior good. As you can see, we've got a much steeper demand curve. And you can see equilibrium moving to equilibrium 2, that is reduction in price, we're actually on the inelastic portion of the demand curve. That's basically below the midpoint. And you can uh, reference some of my other posts and videos you want to know more about elasticity of demand. So in this case, you can see the red area, the loss in revenue from decreasing price, is actually greater than the gain in revenue. So in this case, we've got what we call an inferior good. And this is the case for most inferior goods, but there is one exception to that, and that's called a Giffen good. And that's what I'm going to show you in the next graph. Okay, we have a very strange looking demand curve here. It's kind of curving round. It looks like initially at a high price, it's following possibly like a normal good, but as price falls, the demand curve is starting to turn inwards or starting to go the other way. So you've got what we call an upward sloping demand curve. And you get upward sloping demand curves, what we're talking about today, Giffen goods. You also get upward sloping demand curves for luxury goods, and I'll talk about that another time. So what happens now when price decreases? Quantity also decreases. So let's now take a look at our example of potatoes and rice. And I'll talk about that in more detail in a minute with um, Fred Flintstone. So as the price has fallen, let's say potatoes, a person can now afford to buy more of something else. So in fact that they may actually choose to have less rice and have the other food substance that they prefer. So you actually end up with the same amount of food and they're paying the same price. But now there's a mixture of the higher quality food with the, well, I wouldn't say lower quality potatoes, but I suppose a food that gives you less utility by itself. Maybe, you know, not as much flavor in it as some of the other nicer foods you may have. For example, broccoli. I wouldn't talk about meat. Meat is a typical example that's always given. Being a vegan, I wouldn't talk about that. Maybe we'll talk about tofu. Maybe talk about coconut. Let's now take a look at an example of Fred Flintstone. So Fred Flintstone loves his mushrooms. He also likes, well, uh, he also is okay, should I say, with rice. He's not a big fan of rice, but he'll eat it if he has to. So what happens is, Fred doesn't have enough money to buy mushrooms and rice. He could buy some mushrooms, but it wouldn't be enough to keep him full. 
he would starve just on mushrooms because mushrooms are too expensive. So what Fred can do is instead buy rice. You buy the rice and he'll live and he won't die. That would be enough food to keep him going. But he won't have enough money in order to get the mushrooms, unfortunately. So he's going to have to then just put up with having the rice. So what happens now if the price of rice falls? So if rice becomes cheaper, Fred could buy more rice. He doesn't need to, though, because he can fill his stomach buying rice at the initial price. But instead, what Fred can do is he can now look at mushrooms. And why is that? So for example, he could get the same amount of rice as before, and now he'd be have enough left over to get maybe a very little amount of mushroom. But instead, what Fred will do is he'll have a little bit less rice, and then whatever money he saved from the lower price and also buying of a lower quantity of rice, he'll use that to buy mushrooms. And now he'll have a combination of both rice and mushrooms, and Fred is a lot happier. He has improved his situation. He gains more utility by having both rice and uh, mushrooms in his bowl. Also, I'm talking about utility here. Some of you may not be familiar with that. Again, I have several posts and also other videos describing what I mean by utility. But for the sake of this video here, it's just basic utility as level of satisfaction. So Fred is more satisfied. Now he can have some mushrooms and still have a full belly. Previously, at the higher price of rice, he couldn't just buy mushrooms. He had to settle for rice. So now Fred is far more satisfied having both rice and mushrooms. Though he would probably like a larger proportion of mushrooms than rice. I now like to go back on a topic of a previous video, and that was indifference curves. And indifference curves and budget constraints are a very good way of graphically showing what we mean by an inferior good, a normal good, or a given good. So let's go back to normal goods again. So we've got good A and good B. It's a little bit limited, so we're looking at good A in respect to good B and good B in respect to good A. So we're also looking at again at a decrease in price. So you can see here, you have the budget constraint shifts out with good B because of the uh, decrease in price. And now this person can now access a higher indifference curve. Indifference curve of greater value. Indifference curve is, as I mentioned in my other videos, is basically represents a curve where you get the same level of utility of various combinations of good A and B. So in this case, we've gone from A to B. So that is quite a jump in the quantity of good B. So first of all, we have what we call a substitution effect. We achieve that by getting a line parallel to our second budget constraint, and we bring that down so it runs tangent to our original indifference curve. As you can see, moving from A to C. The substitution effect should always be positive, simply because you're moving from one good to another based purely on a price change with no income effect. But as the price has dropped, your real income has actually increased, so you can get more. It's not your normal income. You're still earning the same, I know, $500 a month, but you can actually do more of it. So that means you have an increase in real income. As you can see here, we're moving now from C to B. So that demonstrates that this good is a normal good, so you'd actually want to buy more of that good if you had a higher disposable income. Now we'll look at uh, inferior goods where that's just a little bit different. Okay, so here we have a typical inferior good. So as I mentioned with the, um, the normal good, we still have that positive substitution effect. As you see, we're moving from A to C. But this time, we have a negative income effect. So going back from C back to B again. So the quantity of B is actually less. So what that means is, if you have an increase in income, you actually decide to buy more of good B. Unfortunately, that, that's the case, but uh, there's a number of different inferior goods out there. Um, like it could be for a particular type of car, for example, as you know, as the price of that car falls, you may, or should I say, as your income increases, you may rather move on to another nicer type of car. So you might call that an inferior good. So we did the same thing as before. We um, we got the uh, second budget constraint. We moved it down so it was parallel to the original indifference curve. That's how we got our substitution effect. And then we just compared C with B. And as B uh, shows a lower quantity for good B than C, we have an inferior good because that's where your income effect comes in. So I'm going to talk about Giffen goods, and that's a very special type of inferior good. So you can see the Giffen good in this graph that we've got here. So exactly the same as a normal good and other inferior goods. 
We uh, we got our second budget constraint. As you can see, the price of good B has fallen, so that has pivoted outwards. And then we have the um, parallel, uh, we call red line um, budget constraint, which is tangent to our original difference curve. So we still get the same movement from A to C as your substitution effect. And like with the other inferior goods, we've got B, and B is actually a lower quantity than C because we've got a negative income effect. So simply, it's like in the case of Fred, as his income goes up, he'll buy less and less rice or potatoes or whatever. In, this, in Fred's case, it was rice, wasn't it? So what makes this a Giffen good and not just a normal inferior good? The fact that the substitution effect is less than the income effect. Or should I say the income effect is greater than the substitution effect. So you end up demanding less of B after the price increase than you did before the price increase. Interesting enough, and I think indifference curves are probably the best way of expressing and describing a given good. I attempted to explain a given good earlier using demand curves, which is interesting with that backward bending, or should I say that upward sloping, should I say it sort of backward bends eventually as price goes up. Uh, and that's how you would demonstrate with a demand curve. And you can actually derive that demand curve using um, these indifference curves here. All right, now this takes me to the end of this video on given goods. It was a reasonably technical video, I must admit. I've tried to add some context using the Fred Flintstone example, using his rice and his mushrooms, as well as talking about potatoes and rice. But here's just a quick recap of the key points. So basically, a given good is something that you will demand less of as your income increases, which is the same as inferior good, which it comes under. But what's very special about a given good is, is if your income increases because of a price decrease, you'll actually demand less, simply because you can use that gain in income to acquire something else, and also you get an additional gain in income by actually demanding less of your given good. And it can be rather subjective. A given good to one person might not be a given good to something else. Like, for example, I've seen people say public transport can be considered a given good. So if the price of public transport went down, people may actually use less of it. This is no, not based on a personal experience, but it, it depends a lot from city to city. So anyway, uh, thank you for watching this video um, here on DTube. So if you liked it, uh, click the like button. If you uh, are not currently following me and you have an interest for uh, economics, and I cover off lots and lots of different things, I focus mostly on microeconomics. I also have my vegan economics section as well, so it might be worth you following. For the uh, YouTube audience, uh, again, it's subscribe and like, and also I have plenty of YouTube videos as well. For my uh, DTube fans and people on Steemit, in the post, I'm going to be, I'll have two questions that will roughly relate to this video in regards to what a given good is. So, um, yeah, so pay attention to those, and um, if you um, provide an answer, I'll, I'll give you a small upvote. Anyway, thank you for watching my video, and uh, hopefully you'll be hearing and possibly seeing more of me, and I look forward to seeing more of you guys too. Thank you. Goodbye.